Okay, but anyways, we see right here it's going to be on the day of Christmas. Now, there are comments that I get online and then uh, even sometimes people on this church about, so pastor, what do you think about Christmas? So I, back then I had a... I had a comment prepared, and I just copy and paste it and send it to them. I don't know if uh, Brother Robert and Brother Jack have that. If they don't, they can ask me, and then I'll send it to them. But uh, let's look at Romans chapter 14, please. We're going to look at Romans 14. So this is a standard answer that I would give to them. So go to Romans 14. Now, is Christmas pagan? So I'll agree with you. Yes, it did come from paganism. And guess what? You wouldn't be surprised that it actually came from uh, the Babylonian religious system, Semiramis Nimrod. So we're going to look at Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10. Notice that they were observing this long before at the BCs. Jeremiah chapter 10. It is a pagan day. There is no doubt about that. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah 10. The Catholic Church, why did they take Christmas and make it into a Christian day? Because that's the Catholic Church habit, to take every pagan observance yep. right, right. and then replace it with Christian themes and meanings. Wow. So that's what they would always do. So look at Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. See, someone's looking at the, the season over there. For the, heath, uh, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest. Uh huh. The work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with what? Silver and with gold. You see those little silver trinkets, those golden glitter trinkets, you know, that they fasten around it. They fasten it with nails and with hammers. See, they literally fasten it on the ground. It's like a Christmas tree here that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. So we see that so far we, that this is a pagan thing that they would do. There are some things that I've also heard, so I don't know how much of it is true, but then they would mention about that it was referring to some kind of phallic sex, sexual symbol as well. And that would match up with a lot of the other obelisks, why they were erected up that way. So it's a lot of uh, dirty, wicked, sexual stuff. You know why? Because where demonism gets darker is referring to something sexual, actually. So it does get pretty dark over there. So I don't know how much of it is true. But you notice why they put the gifts underneath the tree, right? It's as if you're like giving an altar over there. Like all the other pagan idols, you would put gifts or something on top of their altars. So there is no doubt that there is something pagan about it. But if you keep reading over here, be not afraid of them, for they what? Cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do what? Good. You know why? Because it's an object. It's an object. So look at Romans 14. Romans 14. So here's something that a Christian should keep in mind, is that I know that... Uh, in the back of your dollar bill, that it's a wicked symbol, all right? And I know that uh, in the government halls and places around you, we see statues. And then some places, uh, I know of some good Bible-believing churches that try to find a place to rent, and they had a Buddhist temple for their, where they had to rent it from, you know? So then you can imagine the idols around that place, right? The Christian mentality is this, is that because idols are actually just stone. They're nothing, all right? There's nothing, something magical or something scary. Now, it is true, there are cases of demonic forces filling in within an object, but here's the thing, is that to a Christian, because we have the Holy Spirit, those things have no effect on us, you gotta understand, see? So you don't have to be afraid of these things. To those, those things to us, they're just what? They're just an object. That's all that it is. And not only that, it is impossible. One thing I learned is this. It is absolutely impossible every place you go or anything you have in your house, you will find, you will find something pagan, all right? <laughs> Guarantee. The car that you're driving right now, you see that symbol with your wheel, you know? A Mercedes-Benz or, you know, a Toyota Corolla or a Honda. I guarantee you this. You Google that, you might find a pagan, pagan symbol somewhere, all right? 
The hand motions that I gave just now, I bet you you can find something satanic just now. All right? You know why? You only have five fingers. So Satan worshipers, they have so many hand signals, so I bet you one of them is going to hit it somewhere, okay? Yeah, one of them is going to hit it somewhere, you know? So what do Christians do? So this is how Paul talks about how we observe days, which you should think to yourself. You read verse 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master, he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. So notice right here that there's a believer who believes in observing the certain day. Why? Because he's not worshiping the devil or the Catholic Church, he wants to observe it to worship Jesus Christ. But then there's another group of Christians here who believe that that day should not be something glorifying to the Lord. So then what? They don't treat that day as if it's glorifying to the Lord. So that's your simple answer concerning Christmas, see? So then uh, there are Bible-believing pastors who, you know, uh, celebrate Christmas with their churches and other Bible-believing churches who don't celebrate Christmas. Now, uh, me, I don't, okay? I'm sorry, I know, oh, I know, yeah, 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 you're gonna cry, you know, I know, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I don't do Christmas here. But uh, my members here, whatever they do with their own families, they do Christmas not because of, you know, we're gonna worship the Virgin Mary now, we're gonna burn a candle. No, it's because they want to observe Jesus Christ. Also, it is still the day that this pagan world cannot get rid of, this atheist world cannot get rid of, where it's a gospel opportunity. So your pastor, uh, he doesn't believe in saying Merry Christmas, but when I talk to a lost person, that's a good opportunity. So then when I give them a track, I say, Merry Christmas. They can't say no. They say no, then they'll look bad. Remember at the blowout we had? What was very effective? Merry Christmas when we're passing out. People had to accept it, right? Yeah, otherwise they look bad. They look evil, you know? Yeah. Brother Sean had a brilliant idea, you know, when this uh, typhoon hit at one of the Asian countries. He said, you know, pray for that country, pray for that country. And all these liberals just yeah. heartily <laughs> received it after that, you know. Whereas today we get people like, Ugh, like that, you know. Exactly. Yeah, so maybe we just need to wait for Christmas and then the people will be more responsive, right? Yeah, so, so that's how uh, we should observe the days. So people might have even different levels on how they would observe the day. So for example, uh, my family, we don't observe Christmas, but what do we do? We observe the part where we take the day off and we would even give each other a gift, you know, and have a meal. That's our best Christmas. You know why that's our best Christmas? It takes a lot of stinking money and time wasted to build up a stinking tree, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to do that, yeah. Me and my family, we're happy as it is, you know. Hi, hi, you know, we don't even say Merry Christmas. Good day to you, you know. Hey, should we go out and eat? Yeah, let's go out and eat, you know, and that's, that's our Christmas time. Best Christmas ever, man. Oh, that's my best Christmas, man. Yeah, so, you, I mean, you got to realize this too, is that this is also another thing to think about, is that, so you Christians might be able to set up a tree, give out gifts, set up decorations, you know, and you want to do that as what? Something where you maintain a family spirit and you think about, you know, Jesus Christ, thank God that he got born on that day. I know Dr. Upman, he decorated a Christmas tree too, but it's also something you got to be careful where how much money you're spending and how much time you're wasting. That's, good. That's even to a birthday party too. Amen. All right, so you got to realize that every day, if you're going to observe it to the Lord, do it in a way that would please him. That's why everybody, see, is going to have different levels of observing that day. You see that? Everyone's going to have different levels of observing the day. So that's how we treat Christmas. So my simple answer is this. You pray about it. That's it. Yeah. And then if you feel uncomfortable about it, then your answer is already given at the last verse of Romans chapter 14, verse 22 through 23. If you don't have a clean conscience about it, then don't even do it. And if you have a clean conscience about it, then go for it. Yeah. All right, let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. All right, Merry Christmas, everybody. All right, smile. Jesus loves you, okay? All right, 
Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> so, uh, the history of Christmas is that where Semiramis and Nimrod, they, these were the key pillars with the Catholic system. The spirit of Balaam, Jezebel, Balak, all that Balite stuff. So how Christmas was born was uh, supposedly is that during December 25th that time, that was a, uh, when Nimrod died, Semiramis, she gave birth to another child named Tammuz, and then Semiramis, Semiramis proclaimed that this was Nimrod reincarnated and born. So they wanted the world to observe his day. So hence came out Christmas that, kind, that time. So that's how Alexander Hislop would tell the story. Okay, let's go back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. All right, so Christmas time. This is where they make Mary and then they, uh, with the two witnesses dead. Why do they make Mary? Verse, the middle of verse 10. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. It's because these two prophets tormented them. They gave them heyday. I mean, they just destroyed poor old Mother Earth. You know, the environment has spent millions of dollars protecting Mother Earth. And these two witnesses had the audacity to just blow fire on the trees. <laughs> and then so all the earth was dying out. And then so... These two prophets tormented them because why? Because they burned up my beloved pastor who said Jesus loves me. And one of these prophets, these two witnesses, blew fire on him and toasted him alive. <laughs> what a horrible, evil person. You might go, whoa, yeah, that's what's happening. You know why? Because at the tribulation, the Bible talks about false prophets, false pastors. And everybody, everybody has the thinking that my pastor is a really good pastor who loves God. No matter what religion, they think of their religious leader that way. God, he shows no mercy at the tribulation. Why? Because it's called the wrath of God, the tribulation timeline. You're under the age of grace. The street preacher, he might be metaphorically blowing fire at you, but he's not literally blowing fire at you. It's an age of grace. We're trying to give you the gospel of grace, get you out of hell, get you out of fire. But when that tribulation time comes... Christians who have to be patiently persecuted, who, can, who, cannot, who are unable to protect themselves from the uh, evil government, etc., who have to take in the criticism, the scoffing from the majority of the world, who has to show love toward one another and pray for the lost soul and sacrifice for them so that they can get saved, those days are numbered. God put up with that 2,000 years for you. That's long enough. Amen. It's about time that he passes on judgment. That's the reason why there's no better time for you to get saved than right now under the age of grace. Amen. Because when the time of wrath comes, boy, my friend, you better work it out at that time. All right, let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. Verse 11. And after three days and a half, so after three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them. So God puts his spirit of life into them and these people get resurrected again. They resurrected. So then they get resurrected. Keep reading over here. And they stood upon their feet. That's going to be something, right? With their heads chopped off, all of a sudden the body stands up. What do you think people are going to think? This is a zombie moment for them. And then they get their head attached. I mean, can you picture that, man? Dead body lying down, all of a sudden the, bo the body gets up, people freak out, and then the body picks up the head and goes like, ah, oh, right there, right there. And then the people freak out, ah, the little children watching their iPhones, they drop their iPhones, you know. They're like, oh, what's going on over here? And then they have a zombie moment over here. So there's a zombie moment over here. And notice the next part of verse 11, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. No kidding. I'd be, I'd be afraid too, man. <laughs> so everybody was afraid. Great fear fell upon everybody. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven. So somebody from heaven's calling to them, saying unto them, mark those three words down, come up hither. There's the magic word, so to speak, right? Usually when you hear this term, you know what this means. It means it's a rapture. Come up hither. That means from the earth, you go up to heaven. Amen. This was proven at Revelation chapter 4. 
John was on the earth, but when God says come up hither, he went up to heaven. So notice there's a rapture going on over here. Let's keep reading. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. See, they went up to heaven on a cloud like Jesus did, right? At Acts chapter 1, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And what? He went on a cloud and went back up. And their enemies beheld them. So their enemies who watched their dead bodies lying on the street now see them going raptured up to heaven. How about that? So notice right here, there is undoubtedly a rapture. So then, Bible-believing Christians, we believe in a doctrine called the pre-tribulation rapture. That was proven at Revelation 4. I'm not going to expound on that. I already explained it thoroughly at Revelation 4 and in my 200 other videos debunking the post-tribulation rapture. Amen. Yeah, so I don't have to do that again. Yeah. My church members practically memorized Matthew 24 more than John 3.16, all right? So I don't have to do that again, all right? It's amazing how many onliners are infatuated with the church going through the tribulation. That mentality's got to be broken, man. Okay, so you've got a strong spirit taking a hold of you. All right, but anyway, Revelation 4, this was already proven as a pre-tribulation rapture. So this was referring to the Christian church. I already proved that. But we see over here another rapture sometime at the later end of the tribulation, right? Wow, how about it? This is something that typical independent fundamental Baptist churches cannot swallow. But it's true. There is a rapture sometime at the later part of the tribulation. That's why we believe in two raptures. Your rapture was mentioned here, Revelation 11. I mean, come on, what else are you going to call that, huh? Their body gets up, resurrected, just like you, 1 Thessalonians 4, and it goes up to heaven. All right, that's same as 1 Thessalonians 4. So it's plain as day. That's why one thing that your pastor has a strong conviction and belief in, which is what I really hope other Bible-believing preachers will hold the fort on, is right doctrine. So some of you know your pastor is that way. I grew up from an independent fundamental Baptist background. I grew up listening to so many IFB preachers. My dad was one of them. He was going to be an IFB preacher himself, but someone gave him the poison of one of Dr. Upman's book, and then he just swallowed it up, and then he became a Bible believer. Why? Because he was seeing scripture. So one thing that I don't like is how Bible believing preachers, because they know that these doctrines that they've learned from other Bible believing preachers are controversial to their fundamentalist friends, they don't really teach that to their church. Now I believe in using wisdom when you grow a church. The first day when people come in, you don't talk about blue-blooded aliens, all right? They'll think you're a blue-blooded alien after that, and then they'll run away from you, all right? So you got to give them milk. You got to give them milk. But for crying out loud, people just keep harping on the milk. They don't slip in the meat or even give them the meat at all. And some people, this is their first time hearing this doctrine. And what would be embarrassing for you as a Bible-believing pastor is that if somebody watches this video, hears this doctrine, but doesn't hear it from you after years of pastoring a church. So what I want Bible-believing pastors to understand, this is very important to stand for right doctrine. Oh, it's too deep. No, you got to, uh, doctrine is doctrine. You got to make them grow. If you don't believe in growing your members, but only growing them as to a toddler level, that's it. Then one day, some cult pastor out there is going to grab that toddler from your church because they only had a toddler level of understanding. Bible-believing preachers, we weren't swayed by a lot of the stuff going on online. You know why? We were already grounded with doctrine. But then these charismatics, Calvinists, and post-tribbers are getting all over online and able to take in sheep. You know why? Because pastors have not been feeding their members. I mean, we've had some of these idiots trolling inside our church, right? Rightfully called idiots because they want to start trouble. They want to steal some of our members. That didn't work with our church. I wasn't worried either. I just let, it, let the fool talk to whatever member in there. And then my members are the one who come to me. Pastor, I don't like that guy. And I was like, yeah, I'm not the only one. Yeah. 
One of them, I felt really bad because Brother Stan just glared at that guy the whole service. And me, I was preaching about dispensationalism. I was like, how many of you believe we're raptured before the tribulation? Everyone went, amen, except that bozo sitting at the back. So I actually felt bad for the guy. So I tried to tone it down a bit because Brother Stan kept glaring at that guy. And then Brother Tom, you know, he didn't mean to, but his back was hurting. So he literally stood right next to this guy the whole time. The guy was sweating, you know, it was like panicking, you know. After church was over, Tom said, hi, I'm Tom. And the guy's like, oh, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. And then he just ran over to me. You know, we get weird people inside this church, you know. Stick around, we get weird people. You've seen it, right, already? Yeah, we, we get weird people. Stick around. But, but pastors don't have to worry if they what? Grounded their members right, to begin with. Right. But you're not going to ground them if you keep shying away from giving them meat. They need meat so that they can be strong. Amen. And Paul mentioned that so many times. They're not strong enough in meat yet. You've got to give it to them.